our online community. Welcome into the sanctuary here at Fam Church. We're delighted that you're here with us this morning. Fam Church, do me a favor and put your hands together and let's welcome our online community. Thank you so much for being with us today. We're honored that you would take some time to be with us. People watch us from all over. I don't know why it goes from here out to Drexel, out to Valdez and Hickory, and then it goes north uh, up into Canada, and then it leaves Canada and it goes around the world. So we have people watching us all over the world this morning, and it's, uh, we just welcome you in the house of the Lord today, and we, we hope that you're having a good Resurrection Sunday today. Praise God. Well, um, how many of you know that you're not the only one on a journey? That Pastor John's on journeys too. How many of you know that there's a lot of times people think that pastors have arrived and that we stay in some sort of third heaven existence where we just, you know, commune with God all day and we're immune to problems and issues and so forth and so on. How I many that's just a, a lie? As a matter of fact, what happens a lot of times is pastors are put through the ringer in order to serve as an example for other people. And I'm certainly not discounting the fact that everybody in here has had challenges in their life. We all have. Can I get a witness? But I've had them too. Mine, unfortunately, have been self-induced. <laughs> Because I'm thick like that. It's not that stuff happens to me and that, you know, I'm a consequence of, of things going sideways that were outside of my control. No, I, I brought my own stuff on myself. And so I've been on a journey. Now, my journey started when I was 24. That's when I became a believer in the things of God. I was 24 years old. And so, when I started this journey and I became a believer, the soil that was in my spirit was right for the Word. When you turn that switch on and you believe God for the first time, you got to be extra careful with new people in the faith. Can I get a witness? You just do. Because what you learn in those first seasons as a new Christian, how do you know it stays with you a long time? And, it, and in some cases, we never outgrow it. Even though it might be bad theology or bad preaching or whatever, we never outgrow it. Even though people can take you to the Word and show you, <laughs> you don't believe it because you were told something and you never really researched it yourself. And so therefore, you just took it as gospel truth that that was the truth. But then when you really start reading the Bible and really start trying to get your own understanding and working out your own salvation, you realize that a lot of the stuff that maybe your first pastor told you wasn't necessarily all true. Maybe what grandma had to say wasn't exactly right. And so when I became a believer at 24, these were the words that were put into my spirit. John, God is a result of oriented God. Now think about that. John, God is a result oriented God. He expects results. And if you don't give him results, he's going to be mad with you and you may not make heaven. Because God has gifted you and he has talented you. And you better have something to show for it, young man. So, listen, I was already driven, okay, because that's a personality trait of mine. So I was already driven. 
I had already had some things coming out of my background. My dad took off and left when I was four years old. I, didn't, I was raised by a single parent in poverty. And so I already had some factors at work that were driving me to be successful anyway because I wanted to get out of what I was raised around. Anybody in here wanted to get out from what they were raised around? You just, you had to get out. Life in your home was an example of dysfunction and you had to get out. And the only way for you to get out was to chase the American dream and get it while the getting's good. And then on top of that, you put this idea that God is a result-oriented God, and if you don't have something to show for your time on earth at the end of time, well, it's just not going to be good for you. And so as soon as I found me a way out, let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, I ran hard. I was running hard for the kingdom of God, mind you, but I was running hard. Got saved at 24. Within six months, I was sent to an undergraduate Christian Bible college to learn all this stuff that I had just been exposed to for the very first time in my life. By the time I was 28, I was pastoring a church. I'd never been at a board meeting, y'all. And all of a sudden, I'm presiding over one. I pastored that church so hard from 28 to 32 that I went through burnout. Because everything I touched turned to gold. Now, I don't know how many people can identify with that, but I'm telling you, I was in a place that wherever I done ministry for the Lord, it took off. Didn't matter if it was children's ministry, youth ministry, it did not matter. Everything I did took off. And I thought, well, what do we have here? And so when you got that personality trait of being driven and you're running from poverty, and then you add all this stuff in the middle of it. Now, you got your own deal, too. I, I, I'm not taking away from that. I just want you to see where, where I'm coming from. Then we'll get to our sermon content here, which is to be content. At 32, I stood before a congregation and wept my way out. I had to resign because I couldn't take it no more. Because I had learned a lot of things in undergraduate school. One thing I did not learn how to do was to tell people no. And let me, maybe there are some of y'all in here this morning that are yes people. Let me tell you something. Those of you who are watching, maybe we have a lot of yes people watching this morning. Let me tell you something. If you're a yes person, you better learn how to say no. As hard as it is, you better learn how to say no. Because I'm telling you, living a life of being a yes man is brutal. And it's, if you're a yes person, it's hard to tell people no. And I didn't know how to tell people no. Pastor John, can you do this? Yes. Pastor John, can you go visit this one? Yes. Pastor John, can you do that? Sure. Pastor John, can you go up here and teach the seniors at the, at the nursing home? Sure. Pastor John, can you, Pastor John, Pastor John, can you, can you, can you, can you, and boom, yep, yeah, of course, yes, yeah, sure, yeah, of course, I'm the man, yeah, you got it. At 32, I sat before a congregation and wept. Resigned that church, moved to Boston, Massachusetts, some faraway land. Overseas somewhere. To the home of the Catholic faith. And got surrounded by some charismatic Catholics that were so deep and so rich in their faith, I will forever be indebted to those folks because they helped me heal. But stubbornness is persistent. Can I get a witness in the house? Stubbornness is persistent. That's why it's called stubbornness. And so I went back and I pastored another church down in Jacksonville, Florida, and I gave it my all, and that church took off too. And now all of a sudden, because it took off, now I got, and I, I, listen, I'm not bragging here or nothing. I'm not trying to be braggadocious, but I'm just telling you. 
that the Lord blessed and my family blessed their hearts. You know, most people might invest in 401ks and stuff. My family has always vested in real estate. And so now all of a sudden I've got multiple pieces of property. I'm pastoring a church that's growing and thriving. I've got my own house that I'm living in. I've got a wife that loves me. I've got three children. I've got a new truck and my wife's got a new car. And I'm eating what I want to and living like I want to and doing everything that, because listen, I was in a blessed season. And I had everything a man could ever want. This side of glory. And I was absolutely miserable. I was irritable. Can you imagine this being irritable? Huh. I was irritable. I, you didn't want to be around me. And my wife would come to me, Miss Kristen, the first lady. She'd come to me and say, what's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? I don't know. I'm miserable. She said, John, you, you, you've got everything you could possibly want. Family that loves you. And automobiles. and You've got a church. and You're pastoring. And that's what you said you wanted to do. And I said, I don't even know if I want to do that anymore. I said, if this is pastoral ministry... You can have it. I don't want this. And I was absolutely miserable. But here I was. I resigned that church. So I got two churches under my belt, an undergraduate degree, and a master's degree and I'm like 41 years old, and I'm like, now what? Right? Now what? And so then Morganton calls. And I knew then, I said, and me and Kristen both knew, I said, this is, this is the chance. And Kristen had things she was going through too, and I'll, but I'll leave her testimony to her. I said, this is my chance. I knew that I had enough education in my gut and I had enough experience in my gut that if I could get in the right situation, I was going to be dangerous in a good way. And Morganton opened itself up. And I came up here. And, so, and I've been here for seven years. And so for seven years, I've been relearning the art of contentment. And how many of you know that it, there's an art form to that? you got to learn it. You have to learn it. Those of you watching, you have to learn this. Can't nobody teach you this. you got to learn it for yourself because what makes you content is not going to make me content. You see that? Contentment might be crocheting. That would put me in an early grave. I'm not a crocheter. So you have to learn what is contentment for you. But today I'm going to walk you through the Bible a little bit and give you some, maybe a, a road map that will help you reprioritize your life because that's where I'm at, midlife. Come on, I'm in my midlife. It's time to reprioritize my life to make sure that what I'm doing is beneficial for the kingdom of God and myself. So this is, this is the journey I've been on. It's taken seven years to get there, but praise God, I think I'm getting there. Not that I've arrived, because I can still be miserable like that. Can't you? If for a brief second, I get my eyes, and this is you too, if for a brief second I get my eyes off the prize, I am a miserable cuss indeed. And if the truth be told, so are you. And so are you who are watching. 
So, Pastor John, what can we do, right, to make sure that we are content? And I'm proud to say that the Bible's got a lot to say about contentment. Now, I, 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 I want to forewarn you, though, before we get into the Bible, that it's going to rock your world today, okay? Because what the Bible tells us about contentment and what the culture in which we live tells us about contentment is totally different. Totally different. Our culture teaches us, and I've been on that track too, that we got to get up, get going in the morning. Because one thing I do believe is true is that America has always been for sale. And if you want it, Go get it. If you want it, you've got to get up earlier than anybody else. Come on. This is the game that's played. If you want it, you get on up in the mornings before anybody else gets up because the early bird gets the worm. And you get up early in the morning and you start hitting it from daylight. And you grind all day long. And when you come home, you still don't really turn it off, do we? Because there's still a checklist in our brains, those of us who are highly efficient, highly motivated to get things done, even though the day's over. The day ain't really over. We got our, we got our checklist in our minds. So you run as hard as you can run all day long. You leave zero room for margin in your life. And you get it. Because it's there for you to get if you want it. But listen to me, brothers and sisters. That constant state of getting it comes at a price. It comes at a price. Again, America's for sale, baby. You want it, go get you some. It's there. We live in the land of plenty. If you want it, go get it. But I'm here to tell you, it comes at a price. Your mental state, your physical state, your emotional state, your spiritual state, dare I say, your wholeness is going to be compromised when all you do is run after things that this world provides for you. And I'm not here to tell you not to have nice things. Oh, I've got nice things. Trust me, the Lord is blessed, Pastor John. I've got nice things. I just don't want it no more. I dare I say, I told Christian, I said, you know what? I told her, I said, we need to go to an estate sale. She's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I think I'm turning one of them yard sale people. But that's what they do on Saturdays, get up. Because I want to go buy something else rather than go to Walmart. Because I despise Walmart. And I'd rather go buy it off somebody who's passed on. They don't care. Gallows whom you can laugh in church. Again, did I properly warn you about what the Bible's got to say to you today? Godliness with contentment. This is 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 12. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You can get a lot if you keep your nose clean and you live a godly life, and you learn the art of contentment, those two things combined is great gain. Verse 7, we brought nothing into this world. How many of you, how many of you brought something into the world? Nobody. Those of you watching, you brought absolutely nothing into this world. You may have inherited something or whatever, but you come in here with nothing. We brought nothing in this world. Y'all know the rest of it. You ain't taking none of it with you. But that flies in the face of what our culture tells us. Right? Our culture tells us what? Remember? He who dies with the most toys wins. No, actually, you lose. Because everything the world tells you is a lie. 
And if the world tells you we have reached that place in our society, when the world tells you one thing, you can bet your bottom dollar that the absolute opposite of that is what's true. That's where we've reached in our society. Doesn't matter if it's coming from the news media, from a politician, even some preachers. God forbid. You brought nothing in this world, you ain't taking none of it with you. This is the verse that changed my life. If I can just have food and I eat well, <laughs> if I can just have food and clothing, with that, the Christian is to be content. Oh, think about how revolutionary that is, y'all. Those of you who are watching, I mean, really think about that. Do you know what your life would change? If you took that verse of Scripture seriously, do you know how your life would change? That if you concerned yourself with getting a good meal for the day, and that's what I did for half a day yesterday. Pastor John, what would you do for half a day yesterday? Half a day yesterday, me and another church member, we built a hog barn and a hog pen. Yes! Like, for what? To grow pigs. For what? To eat. <laughs> Tunnel vision. I, it, why would I go to the grocery store where you can't even hardly find bacon anyway, and when you do, it's over $10 a pound, and it tastes nasty? Well, I can be content with growing my own food and Tim, we're in business. See what I'm saying? In clothes. I don't shop anyway. Do I look like a shopper to anybody here? Those of you who are viewing, do I, do I look like I go shopping at all? The answer to that is no. My wife even asked me this morning, we got pig in a poke tonight. Those of you who can't, come on down. We're going to have a good time tonight. She asked me this morning, she said, John, are your overalls clean for tonight? <laughs> yes. yes, they are. <laughs> Could you imagine how simple your life would be if you went into your closet and just ripped everything out other than a pair of overalls and a few shirts? Am I lying? Do you see how simplification helps? You're like, I wouldn't be caught dead in a pair of overalls. Listen, it's liberating. Buy you a pair. <laughs> I'm learning this. I, I, this 80-20 principle, and I, I'm going to unfold it as it starts to get in my spirit. But listen, 80% of the clothes in my closet, I don't even wear them. 80% of the clothes in my closet, I don't wear them. They're just there. Eighty percent. What do what do I what what do I do with twenty percent of my life that the other eighty percent could seriously go away and I wouldn't even miss it? If we've got food and clothing, brothers and sisters, with this we should be content. But rarely are we, because we've been trained to go get it. We've been trained that other people's opinion of us matter. And if we ain't living to a certain standard, then somebody's going to think ill of us or less of us, therefore, I have to work myself into a frenzy and get on Xanax because I'm worried about what everybody else thinks about me. So my contentment is based on what other people think of me. Hey, y'all can get on down the road with that. 
You can't live your life like that. My contentment has to be between myself and the Lord. I have to live that way. And for so long, I, you know, listen, I used to come to church in suit and ties. How many remember that? Because there was, a, there was an expectation. Well, that around here. And listen, I was trained to think that way. Pastor John, if you get in the pulpit with jeans and sneakers and a T-shirt, people with money ain't going to come to your church. Well, I don't care. I'm not in this to raise a dollar. I'm in here to preach truth and to find truth for myself. And so if people of means can get something out of a redneck, then let's do that. But if they can't, then that's fine too. But I've got to find the art of contentment for myself so that I'm not living a lie for anybody. I encourage you to do the same thing. Can I tell you, you'll find out who your friends are real quick. If we have food and clothing, oh, if there's two verses of Scripture over the last seven years that have really impacted my life. It's this one. If I've got food and clothing, I should be happy with those things. And number two, make it your life's ambition to live a quiet life. Minding your own business. <laughs> Minding your own business. Working with your own hands so that you won't have need of nothing from nobody and your name won't be sullied in the community. People will speak well of you. Make it your life's ambition to live a quiet life. Be content, John, with just food and clothing. You see how simple life can be if you'll listen to the Bible and live like the Bible wants you to live. It'll revolutionize your life. Will you be labeled a radical? Oh, yes. People don't spend their Saturdays anymore building a hog pen. It's not even on the radar. But there we were yesterday. Two country boys making it happen. We got done. We looked at that thing and said, boy, them pigs is going to eat good. And we got fired up. Those who want to get rich <laughs> fall into a trap and temptation. You got many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Dear God, I wish they would read this verse of Scripture to every person who's leaving home to go find themselves and to go make their mark in this world and to go chase the American dream and all of that. Put this in your kid's spirit. That if they run after that stuff, you're going to get it, but there's other stuff that's coming too. Ruin and destruction. God help us. Amen? One of the most misquoted verses in the whole Bible, right here. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. People say the money is the root of all evil. That's a lie. Money's not the root of all evil, the love of money is. Again, I understand we live in a world that requires us to pay bills. And I'm not telling you to work. We got plenty of people right now who won't work. So I'm not telling you not to work. Okay? Because we, we have to live. Just check yourself before you wreck yourself. Don't grow 
ambitious for the love of money. If you love it, it will destroy you. It ain't worth it, brothers and sisters. You listening to me, those of you who are tuning in today? It ain't worth it. Some people, and I got to hurry because we're running out of time. Some people, eager for money, I, I just got to have it, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs because they left the faith. Oh, well, I, all, I, all I have to do is just work this one Sunday. Well, all I have to do is just, 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 it's just two Sundays in a row. And then it's three Sundays in a row. And four, and four, you know it, you're off chasing that daughter on Sunday. You're not getting any richer chasing a daughter on Sunday. Get yourself into the house of God. You will be blessed if you do that. But you... Man of God, and let me put women of God in there too. Flee from all of this. Run! Like your hair's on fire. Run from it! Instead of running after worldliness and money and all that, run after, pursue righteousness, godliness, Truth and faith and love and endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life which you were called to when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, this is the journey that the Lord has had me on going from a miserable cuss to someone who is trying to live a a more godly life and a more disciplined life by chasing the things that at the end of the day truly matters in the heart of an individual. I would encourage everyone under the sound of my voice, everyone who's watching, get in this. Live this way. It will change your life. Listen to me. I promise it will. I'm not a snake oil salesman. I'm being straight up legit with you. I think those young people say, no cap, man, no cap. Is that right? I think no cap means no joke. The young people are laughing because they didn't think a middle-aged man knew no cap. Oh, I know it. I know what busting means too. Get out of that other stuff. Get in the kingdom of God. Pursue righteousness. Get rid of all that. And you'll live a much better life. Well, let's pray. Father, we've been exposed to the word today in your house. And Lord, now it's time to do business with our creator. We've been exposed to the word. Now what do we do with it? I'm no fool I know that there are people here today and people who are watching who can legitimately say, Pastor John, I'm absolutely give out and run ragged with the life that I'm living. Pray for me that God will give me the courage to live a different life. You've opened my eyes up to some things today. Help me. Pray with me that the good Lord, by the power of the Holy Ghost, will help me live a life of contentment, that I will learn the art of contentment. Anybody in this house this morning to say, Pastor John, that's me. I need some of that in my life. Multiple people. Well, the Lord's got your number today. Father, give us the courage and the understanding and the self-control and willpower to change our lives for the better so that we can live better lives for the glory of God. I ask it for these folks today in the mighty name of Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen and amen. Well, give Jesus a hand clap of praise in the house today.
Well, stand to your feet. Those of you who are watching, God bless you. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. Do me a favor. Raise your hands to the heavens. Receive this blessing. It's yours as a child of God Almighty. Now, may the Lord bless you, and may God keep you, and may the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May God be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you, and may he give you peace. Receive that today in the mighty name of Jesus. Love you in the Lord. Go and do good.